It's been a few weeks uh, since we've been in Acts, but the last time that we were in Acts, we, we, uh, we talked about the story of Ananias and Sapphira. And if you remember with the story, they tried to lie about how much they made from selling their land, and we saw that Peter had said that Satan was the reason that they lied. Satan had filled their heart. Satan, we saw in chapter 4, or 3, blanking now, but uh, in chapter 3 or 4, that the religious leaders, he tried to attack from the outside by using their religious leaders, but with Ananias and Sapphira, he tried to corrupt the church from within. But what we learned uh, from Ananias and Sapphira is that sometimes God does take the lives of Christians for sin. God, uh, we looked at uh, 1 Corinthians, and, and we saw how God took the lives of several Christians at the Corinthian church because they were improperly taking the Lord's Supper. 1 John talks about a, a sin that leads to death. And though we can, never, we can never look at a Christian's life, and if someone dies, determine if God took them because of sin. We can't look at that and determine that. We have no reason to believe that God doesn't still sometimes work this way today. But as we talked about in our application last time we spoke, usually the way that God removes sin from the church is through church discipline. In order to keep the church pure and uncorrupted, he gave the church instructions to publicly rebuke and remove those who persist in sin. First uh, Timothy 5, As for those who persist in sin, rebuke them in the presence at all, of all, so that the rest may stand in fear. In Matthew, Jesus says that if you keep rebuking them and they keep refusing to repent, that you treat them like an unbeliever. In order for the apostles in the church to be an effective witness to the world, the church has to be pure. Often uh, people in the church, uh, outside of the church, unbelievers will use uh, people in the church as an excuse for why they don't believe the gospel or why they don't go to church. They look for any excuse they can. And so it's in our best interest, and, and this is how God wants it too, for the church to be pure and have a good reputation. So it gives them no excuse. God cares about the holiness of his church. And so we've seen God discipline the early church by removing Ananias and Sapphira. And so now Luke moves on to show the result of what happens after they've been removed. We can look at verses 12 to 16. Well, verse, uh, Luke, uh, in verses 12 to 16, he shows us the result, which is also one of the major themes in the book of Acts, the growth of the church. And we said at the beginning of Acts, if there's one statement that helps us understand the rest of the book of Acts, it will be back in, in Acts 1-8 when Jesus tells the apostles, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses uh, in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So now let, let's look at verses uh, 12 to 13. Let's read. Now many signs and wonders were regularly done among the people by the hands of the apostles, and they were all together in Solomon's portico. None of the rest dared join them, but the people held them in high esteem. So once again, the, the apostles are here. They're, they're por- performing miracles. They're, they're healing people. This is in front of the Jewish people at the temple. And if you remember... Uh, some time back, Solomon's portico was where Peter and John healed the, the lame beggar. This is the same place, the same location. And if you remember what happened after the healing of the lame beggar, the religious leaders came and arrested Peter and John. And, and they told them to no longer be proclaiming in Jesus' name. They take them from Solomon's portico, arrest them, give them a warning. But here they are again, right back at it, same place. A 
If you remember, after the warning, we didn't just see the apostles just go out and start, start preaching boldly again. They, they went to God in prayer. And they, they asked to God, the apostles asked God if they would have continued boldness to keep preaching in Jesus' name. And so, from our text, we can see that God has granted them that prayer. Notice the bravery of the apostles. Let's think about our own situation for a second. If for some reason the American government had come out and said that if anyone talks about Jesus Christ, that person will be put to death. I imagine and I hope that we would all be strong like the apostles. We would all be brave and be loyal to Jesus Christ. But that doesn't mean that we would be free of fear. And despite the threat of death looming over the apostles' heads, they continued to preach about Jesus. Look at verse 14. And more than ever, believers were added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women. When we come to these texts, they they tend to, to be repetitive. Acts 2.31, and the Lord added about 3,000 to their number. Acts 2.47, and the Lord added daily to their number. Acts 4.4, but many believed the message and the number grew to about 5,000. And we keep seeing these kinds of texts over and over again. But the fact that, that Luke continues to repeat this so often actually demonstrates to us that What this book is about is about the growth of the church. It's about the acts and the miracles of Jesus through the Holy Spirit to grow and protect his church. The apostles have a mission. Jesus spoke about this growth as well in the Gospels. One time he he compared the kingdom of God to, to yeast inside dough, that it started off small, but eventually it spreads throughout the entire dough. He also com- uh, compares the kingdom of God to a mustard seed, which is the smallest of all of farming seeds, but eventually it becomes this, this great big tree. And he says... That's how the kingdom of God, the church, is going to be. It's going to start very small, but it's going to become something very great. And what we've seen when Acts so far is that the church has started very small. It started with about 100 believers, 100 disciples, but now it's growing and it has well over 5,000 people. And if we look at Christianity today, we can really see Jesus' words come true as over a billion people would at least profess to know Jesus Christ. So we have to recognize the importance of seeing the church grow. The text goes on in verse 15, so that they even carried out the sick into the streets and laid them on cots and mats that as Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on some of them. So the apostles and Peter is the one that's focused on here, but they were held in such high regard, high esteem, that the sick people in Jerusalem were brought, they were just wanted to be brought in the vicinity of the apostles in hopes that, that Peter's shadow might just fall on them so that they can be healed. That's bizarre. How are we supposed to think about that? That if Peter's shadow would just fall upon them, that they would be healed. We've seen uh, stories that are similar in the Gospels. One time there's a woman who had an issue of blood for, for over a decade. And in her mind, she thought, if I can just touch the hem of Jesus' garment, I can be healed. 
And she was healed after she touched Jesus' garment. But Jesus was a walking, talking wellspring of life. Jesus was the author of life. He is the author of life. And he's the gardener who takes the thorns and thistles of the old creation and turns it into something new. That wasn't Peter. Peter was a faithful servant of Jesus, but could only do what Jesus gave him authority to. He could only do what Jesus would allow him to. And so even though people thought that if Peter's shadow falls on them, they would be healed, there's no evidence in the text that that's actually true. It's just what they believed. Peter's shadow didn't heal anybody. But what this highlights is, and we'll see why it matters in a second, is the respect that the people had for them, the the way that they held them. Uh, Nobody would even dare come near to them, but they just wanted to be close enough to be in the shadow, and they thought they'd be healed. And this is going to be contrasted with the, the jealousy here in a second of the religious leaders. Let's go on to verse 16. The people who had gathered from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing the sick and those afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were all healed. So this text is is something similar, again, keep using the Gospels as an example, but I just keep seeing so many similarities. In Matthew 4, Matthew writes, And they brought him all the sick, those afflicted with various diseases and pains, those oppressed by demons, those having seizures and paralytics, and he healed them. So, to give a summary of this section, the sin of Ananias and Sapphira threatened the holiness and purity of the church, but God's removal of Ananias and Sapphira allowed the church to continue to be a faithful witness in Jerusalem, which is evidenced by how the numbers of the church kept growing. But we have to ask, can the church survive another attack. What's going to happen when Satan's third wave comes at the young church? Will Jesus' words that the gates of hell will not prevail against his church, are those words true? Will they be true? Let's look at verses 17 and 18. But the high priest rose up and all who were with him, that is the party of the Sadducees, and filled with jealousy, they arrested the apostles and put them in public prison. So we've discussed the, uh, the high priest and the Sadducees, uh, who they were uh, in, in previous sermon. But for a refresh on the Sadducees, they were a group of Jewish aristocrats who believed only in the first five books of the Old Testament, the Torah, And they also denied the future resurrection of the body. All this stuff is going to be helpful to remember as we go on in Acts for why they say certain things. The text says that they were filled with jealousy. So they were seeing how respected the apostles were becoming and how popular the Christian movement was and this combined with the fact that the apostles teaching about Jesus threatened their power. So the religious leaders were angry and jealous. Jealous of the respect. And this anger, this jealousy was so great that they got up, they found the temple police, and they had the temple police go and arrest the apostles and put them into prison. Now, this is the second time that this has happened. And if you're the apostles, and if for the second time now you find yourself sitting in a prison cell, you might start, begin to doubt, or lose hope. How are they ever going to be faithful witnesses in Jerusalem, if they're always being attacked and locked up by the religious leaders whenever they do it. Also, 
How can they witness about Jesus when they're always finding themselves on the brink of death, or at least under the threat of it always? And so as they sit there in their prison cell, possibly anxious, praying, maybe praising God, singing a hymn, verse 19 goes on to describe what happens in the night. Let's look at verse 19 and 20. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out and said, Go and stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. So while the apostles must have had low spirits and racing thoughts while this is going on, not knowing what's going to happen, an angel of the Lord comes and opens the prison doors in the night. Let's notice here that God is willing to do the miraculous so that his mission in the world will be carried out, will continue. God's mission will happen, and sometimes that comes through miraculous means. And, and, and because they had this mission, this is why once the apostles are released, the angel gave them the same command that they always had. Get back to preaching the gospel. The text talks about, says the words of this life. There wasn't a name yet for this new movement centered around the Messiah. But in eight or so chapters, they'll be called something like Christians, meaning Messiah people. And what they're preaching was the word of life. Think about what's being said here. There is a message, and we can see this from from Romans 1, from 1 Corinthians 1, gospel's the power of God. There is a message that has divine power behind it that when it is spoken and somebody hears it and believes it, People receive life. How amazing is that? That there are some words you can speak that if they are accurate to the gospel, if they are an accurate presentation of the gospel, there is divine power behind it. And people will be transformed. People will be saved. It has the power for people to come to know their creator. If people believe the gospel, this, this word of life, people will be transformed, broken, freed from their sin. There is no other message that you can say. There's nothing that you can say to somebody that has the power to do that. Nothing else. Notice, I want want us to see this too, that the healings and the miracles of the apostles are not the focus of the angel, but preaching the gospel is. He didn't say, get back in the temple and start healing all the sick, but go preach the word of this life. The healings only testified to the message. Once again, uh, going to the Gospels often today, but we see a very similar understanding of how healings and, and preaching work together when we go back to the Gospels. In Luke 4, Jesus had spent days, days healing the sick, and when the sick, they just kept coming and kept coming and kept coming and kept coming. Jesus finally said, I have to go preach the good news of the kingdom, for that is the reason that I came. And yes, Jesus is here to restore and recreate the world. But only those who will be a part of the new creation and a part of that new world are those who believe the words of this life, who believe the message of the kingdom, the message of the gospel. 
And that was the, uh, the purpose of the apostles as well. And so that's what they did when we go to verse 21. It says, And when they heard this, they entered the temple at daybreak and began to teach. So they listened to the angel, and despite the persecution that they were receiving, went right back to what the angel and Jesus had commanded them to do at the very beginning, to be his witnesses in Jerusalem. How should we think about this, though? I mean, they are preaching in the temple where they were just arrested. They're not actually, you know, they're not hiding anything. How are the apostles not going to be spotted and arrested again by the religious leaders? In the middle of verse 21, we see that Luke shifts the scene from the apostles preaching in the temple to what's going on behind closed doors with the religious leaders. Let's read. When the high priest came and those who were with him, they called together the council, all the synod of the people of Israel, and sent to the prison to have them brought. So at some point, In the day, uh, perhaps in the morning, daybreak is when the apostles are, are teaching, so early in the morning, the religious leaders with the high priest gather together so that they can have another hearing with the apostles. And so they send the temple police to go and get them. But look at what happens in verses 22 and 23. It says, When the officers came, they did not find them in the prison, so they returned and reported, We found the prison securely locked and the guards standing at the doors. But when we opposed them, we found no one inside. Or when we opened them, we found no one inside. So, the moment that the apostles are, they're in the temple preaching the gospel, the words of this life, The temple police are are going to get the apostles and they arrive at the prison and everything seems to be in order. The guards are there, the door's locked. They open the door, no one's there. And so they come back and they report that the, the prison cell's empty They report this to the religious leaders, to the Sanhedrin. That would be very confusing. Can you imagine coming home from work one day and uh, seeing your kids play like normal around the house? Your wife, maybe she's cooking something or, or your husband's cooking something, whoever does that. But notice that everything in your house is missing. Your couch, your TV, your coffee table, your bed, everything's gone, but everybody's carrying on like something's normal. That would have made the situation even more perplexing because the guards didn't see anything. The door was locked. But the apostles, gone. And and verse 24 says exactly that. When the captain of the temple and the chief priests heard these words, they were greatly perplexed about them. And it also says that they were wondering what this would come to. What's all, what's going to come about of all this? What's going to happen? How's this going to end? Now, if you're in the Sanhedrin, you're not going to think that an angel of the Lord came and opened those prison doors. You're not going to think that. You're going to think of more natural reasons, especially if you think that this is opposing the Jewish law. You're not going to think that God's helping them by sending an angel. You're going to think of more natural reasons for why they would have escaped. And the kind of thoughts that must have been going through their head is, 
Maybe we have a guard that's sort of sympathetic to this Christian movement. Maybe we have temple police. Maybe there's even people in the Sanhedrin that are on the sides, that are on the side of the apostles. If the apostles' following has now gotten to this level, it's easy to see how they're going to wonder how all this is going to end. Finally, in verse 25, Luke records that someone found the apostles. He writes, And someone came and told them, Look, the men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. So the apostles have been escaped, have escaped, they've been found and are in preaching in the temple yet again. So things are starting to come to a boiling point. What's going to happen to them now? How are the religious leaders going to respond after what to them would be a slap in the face? What's going to be the fate of the apostles? Tune in next week. The point of the narrative is this. God used miraculous means to thwart the plans of the religious leaders trying to shut down the mission. God used miraculous means to thwart, thwart the, plans of the, uh, the plans of the religious leaders who were trying to shut down the mission. Application point. God sometimes uses miraculous means to rescue us so that we can carry out his mission, but many of us are freed to carry out the mission anyway. We don't need to be rescued. What would you say is God's mission on the earth today? What is God's mission? What's his plan? What's his purpose? What's his goal? It's for the gospel to go to the ends of the earth and to bring glory to his name. For the gospel to go to the ends of the earth and to bring glory to his name. God has people in every age and in every nation, and we are tasked with the mission of bringing the gospel to all people, whether by going ourselves or by sending money or by witnessing to our neighbors, family, friends. When we look at the Bible and at church history, we can see these great examples of, of God doing miraculous things so that he can carry out his mission, his plan. Uh, first in the Bible, in the Exodus, the, the Jews, they were enslaved to the Egyptians and God brought plagues and then finally miraculously parted the waters of the Red Sea to allow his people to cross. And then when he rescued the Israelites, he gave them a mission. That may be surprising to some of us because many of us, when we read our Bible, we often don't know what all that stuff in the middle is for. We, we want to just go straight from the fall to Jesus and I don't know what everything else is about in here. But God did have a mission to save the world and the Bible is an unfolding, uh, progressively revelatory unfolding of that plan. It's progressive revelation. God had a mission to save the world and he planned on doing it through the nation of Israel. When he told Abraham that through you and your offspring, the entire world would be blessed, God is saying that Israel is God's instruments to save the world. Through them, through you and your offspring. And so after the Exodus, if God has a mission for Israel to save the world, shouldn't we hear something about that? We would expect for God to restate that, and he does. Israel's called many things. They're called a kingdom of priests, and we could talk about what that means and in, in, in how they relate to the world. They're also called a light to the nations. They were supposed to, to be obedient to Yahweh, and the, this obedience, Yahweh would bless Israel, and this blessing upon Israel would be attractive to the other nations to attract them 
to Yahweh. That's what it meant for them to be a light to the nations. So God miraculously rescued Israel in the Exodus for the purpose of them continuing the mission that God spoke about to Abraham. God saves Israel so that they can save the world, which we find out later comes through the Messiah. We can even see God using miraculous means to rescue his people throughout church history, but there's one other example as a, in our own text, actually. Um, the same thing happens with the apostles. Just as God rescued Israel to give them a mission, he now in our text miraculously saves the apostles so that they can continue on their mission. We also see it throughout church history. William Tyndale, he was a Christian scholar who wanted to make the Bible accessible to the common man. But the work of translating the Bible into a language so that the common person could have it for private use was forbidden. And because the church and state, and if you want to understand church history, some people always talk about how, they always talk about how Calvin had somebody killed for heretical beliefs, but in those times, the church and the state were one. So they, they were the same, they, they, were, they were together. The government and the church went together. So to, to disobey the church is to disobey the government in a lot of ways. And, um, and, to, and so if, if William Tyndale did this, he would be doing something illegal. And he could possibly be killed for it. But he believed that the work was so important, and he went on translating the Bible into Greek, uh, the Greek and Hebrew into English. Later, he was betrayed by a friend, and he was executed. And what they did is they tied him to a stake, they strangled him, and burned him. But before he died, he cried out, Lord, open the king of England's eyes. And a year later, God did that. King Henry VIII allowed for the Bible to be sold and, and read. And there are many, many stories of Christians even today that are on the mission field that talk about how they were captured and miraculously freed. Uh, I'm getting a story from a, a book that I read recently, but in it, it talks about a Christian in China named Yun. And Yun had been arrested over 30 times for preaching the gospel. But finally, and recently, they decide to lock him up without ever intending to release him. And wanting him to, do to die, they denied him food and water for 74 days. That is medically impossible for someone to survive that long without water. But God kept him alive. And then they take Yun and they transfer him to a maximum security prison and they beat his leg so that he couldn't escape. But one day, for some reason, he got it in his mind, I'm just going to try to walk out through the front doors. So he gets up, and he walks by prison guard after prison guard and police officers, and no one says a word to him. And he makes it outside, and he's free. Walks right out one day. That's very similar to our story that we just read about in Acts. Both of them seem to be invisible to the prison guards. Yun, he left, he was free, but he was once again wanted as an escaped criminal by the Chinese government. And there are so many other examples that we could talk about, about how God does these miraculous things to, to sort of free us, to get back to doing his work. But we also need to realize that God doesn't often do miracles either. 
Though, and we'll see it again, that God saves the apostles a lot in Acts, tradition tells us that almost all the apostles died horrible deaths. Peter, crucified upside down. James, died by the sword. And the apostle John, listen to this, though this didn't kill him, was dipped in boiling oil and then exiled to the island of Patmos. Bartholomew, skinned alive. They took his skin off and then they beheaded him. God has a wonderful plan for your life. <laughs> not all, not, he does, but not for, that doesn't mean we're without suffering. And we could go on and on and on and talk about how the rest of the apostles died these horrible deaths. So God does often rescue his people for the purpose of setting them right back again to, to carry out the mission, but he doesn't always. Some, sometimes he's ready to take us. We have to understand that that works in, in other areas as well. Take healings, for instance. Sometimes God does heal people miraculously. You can go online and read, and, and this isn't just simply from Christian stories. You can read the doctors who, who have talked about a giant tumor being somewhere and having uh, a very, uh, uh, thinking that the person's going to die, it's inevitable, and then all of a sudden the tumor's just gone. You, you can read the, the doctors saying this. But often God heals through the ordinary means of modern medicine, through surgery and medicine and, and other things as well. But still often God doesn't heal at all. And we have to be ready to accept that. Sometimes God does see fit to do miraculous things to carry out his mission but that's not always the way that he works. That's not the primary way that he works. But the point with all this is that today, right here, right now, most of us need no rescue from anything. We're not locked in prison like the apostles. We're not dying from any diseases that we know of, at least many of us, most of us. And by the way, sometimes Margie will ask me, she's like, you need to go to the doctor to, to get a checkup. And what I like to do is I like to respond like George Costanza did in Seinfeld, which is no, because if I go to the doctor, they might find something. <laughs> but the point is, is that we, like the apostles, we have a mission as well. And we are free to carry out that mission. We don't need God to do some miracle. You can talk to your neighbor today. You can talk to your friend, your family. You can give money to missionaries. There's no threat of you being locked up. There's nothing physically keeping you from being able to go, uh, to go evangelize or go witness or, or help the mission in some way. There's nothing stopping you. And if you're still here, that is what God expects of you, to be a part of of the mission to bring the gospel to the ends of the earth. And so ask yourself, are you taking part in that mission? How? Are you evangelizing? Are you a missionary? Are you giving money to support missionaries? Think about these things because that's what God expects for all of his people, from all of his people. And if we're not doing anything to carry out God's mission, let's call it like it is. We are, we are being disobedient, and, and it's a sin. Unbeliever, why aren't you believing in Jesus? God is a God of justice. And you have lived your entire life not just sinning occasionally, 
you're drowning in sin. And because God is a God of justice, he will punish you for what you've done. It'll be an eternal punishment. You wouldn't want to be there even a second. But it'll last an eternity. It will never, ever stop. If five billion years went by, some unfathomable time, it would be just like it just started. But listen to this. On the cross 2,000 years ago, Jesus, the God-man, went and paid for the sins of humanity. God, a God of justice, had to satisfy his justice, and Jesus took the punishment for what we have done. He paid it all. If you repent and believe, God will make you one with Jesus, his son. He will forgive you in Jesus. And he will still be a God of justice, even though he's letting the guilty go free, because Jesus was guilty in your place. He was counted as if he had done it. So repent and believe the gospel. You can be forgiven today. Let's pray. Father, uh, thank you again for this gathering. Thank you for um, the opportunity once again to preach. I pray, Father, that the, the words of this life that the angel told the apostles to go preach would also be on the tip of our tongues. That the words of this life, that we would be ready to take it to our neighbor, to our family, to our friends, Just the words right now of an atheist pen teller, pen, uh, pen Gillette, I believe is his name, said that if Christians truly believe the gospel and they think that I'm going to go to hell if I don't believe the gospel, I'm actually offended that every Christian I've ever met hasn't came and preached the gospel to me. It's funny that an atheist like him has a better understanding of the seriousness than many of us Christians do. And I pray, Father, that we would understand that. Give us a burden for the lost. Thank you for this wonderful mission that we get to take part in. And thank you that we live in a country and a place where we don't have to, have to uh, worry about being locked up for, for sharing Jesus. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.